Hello and good afternoon, beautiful souls. It's Catherine Ewing here from Sacred Heart Alchemy and uh, the Divinely Inspired Feminine Leaders Facebook group. So um, welcome to this quiet Sunday afternoon. It's um, wherever you are, I'm not sure how it is, but if you're here in the Northeast, hey Tori, uh, I know, Tori, you're and, and Kelly, you guys are experiencing the same weather I am, <laughs> which was right early snow on Friday, kind of a funky Saturday and sort of dark and rainy Sunday. Um, and it's kind of thrown me into this really very quiet and contemplative place. I've been trying not to be busy and just sort of settling in to... Um, feeling into how I want to spend every moment. So I've been uh, sort of leaning into just meditation and I have been um, listening to some of the recordings um, and doing some of the reading from the Sophia Code, which is um, one of my favorite books and also I've uh, been guided to pull some oracle cards from my Mother Mary oracle deck because it's the chapter on Mother Mary from the Sophia Code that I've been um, interacting with over the last couple of days. And as I was sitting here today, I'm not even sure what sparked this memory, but I remembered a story. Um, I think it's because I've been thinking a lot about um, myself, my work moving forward, what I really want and uh, this course that I'm creating and what I want that to be for women and even just doing this work the last few days, diving more deeply, there's a, there's a much deeper spiritual aspect to it than what I was imagining um, even early on. Uh, it's not a surprise to me that it would be going in this direction, but it's... Uh, it's all swirling around here today. But in thinking of all of that, um, I remembered a story that I heard, um, another storyteller, hi Joyce. I remembered a, a story that I heard maybe 10 years ago now. And I did a little fact checking just to make sure what I'm about to tell you is true as far as I can. <laughs> as I can find uh, facts to back it up. Um, in the middle of the story, I'm not sure, you know, where there may be some truth, where there may be some fiction. Um, but I think you'll find that uh, the details are not important as the message. So uh, years ago, I heard a story um, about a white Bengal tiger a female named Mohini, and she was actually one of the first uh, litters born in captivity um, in India where they successfully bred a white Bengal tiger. Now, this was a big deal. White Bengal tires, uh, <laughs> tires, tigers, <laughs> white Bengal tigers, um, in Italy, which is such a mythical and sort of mysterious society, right, based on a lot of myth and um, mythology, the the white Bengal tiger is tiger is very highly um, revered. So this particular white female white Bengal tiger named Mohini was uh, the daughter of um, the largest white Bengal, male white Bengal tiger. Uh, I'm forgetting his name, but it was something like Mohi. So she was Mohini, he was Mohi. Anyway, she was born in captivity and her name means enchantress. So the name of this beautiful white Bengal ti tiger translated in, in English into entrant entrantus. I am getting all caught up on my, my uh, in my tongue today here with these uh, words, enchantress. That's what I was trying to say. So 
um, white Bengal tigers, for some reason, develop more quickly um, than the, the usual sort of orange colored tigers, and they uh, grow to be uh, larger and heavier. And they're quite rare, of course. So this particular um, Bengal tiger was purchased by a German American um, when uh, India was sort of willing to sell these beautiful creatures. And it stayed in India and he was planning to bring it to the United States as a gift to the American children, he was gonna put it in the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. And um, politics got in the way and India decided it wanted to keep its white tigers and it was not gonna honor um, the sale of the tiger, you know, whatever. So the, the way this the story goes is that President Eisenhower, now this was in 1960, President Eisenhower intervened and um, India was gonna put a ban on exporting these tigers. And with his intervention, they came to an agreement that they would let the owner, uh, the or the person owner, I hate to even use the word owner over a, 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 a creature as in white Bengal tiger, but the per the person who put money down um, allowed to bring the, that last tiger uh, out of India, and that was agreed to. And so this fella, John Klug, um, brought the tiger uh, to America and made a couple of other stops along the way. And this was going to be a big deal, right? Lots of celebration. Um, there were planning committees and, you know, all kinds of people involved in how they were going to create the perfect habitat for Mohini and where would be the best place for her. And um, it took years and years for their, them to come to agreement about all of this. And in the meantime, this growing female white Bengal tiger was living in a very small enclosure and she would, you know, do a lot of pacing around the inside of the enclosure. But that was her world for, I think the story went like five years before they finally completed this beautiful um, habitat at the zoo. And they just, you know, imagined her, you know, being in this wide open space where she could just roam free, right? And live out her life in captivity. Well, the day came, there was a big parade. You know, she was paraded through a few different cities on her way to Washington, D.C. And they finally got to the zoo where they were going to bring her out of the cage and she refused to get out. She just stayed in the cage. And I'm not sure exactly how they got her out. I imagine there was a lot of pushing, prodding, you know, noise, whatever it was to, to get her to leave the enclosure that she had been in or something similar to it, a traveling version of it for so many years. And she eventually left the enclosure and got out into this, you know, what at the time was, I'm sure, a very impressive habitat that they had created for her. And she immediately went to the far back corner um, and basically stayed in that far back corner of this habitat for the rest of her years, walking in um, a rectangular shape. And she was bred and she had children and they, you know, they were sent to other zoos or whatever. But this beautiful creature, and if you saw the picture of her, you know, on either one of my Facebook pages, you just see the magnificence, right? The, the sovereignty, the strength, 
the just pure power in this gorgeous creature, right? It's like they know who they are, right? And yet, even in that knowing, in that DNA, in um, her own sense of herself, those first five years uh, or six years, you know, by the time she got moved out of India, um, were so influential. Her, her, her captivity, the way that she was required to live in a small enclosed place, it's almost like it bred her natural knowing of who she was out of her. And she was never able to come back to that magnificent, powerful, you know, tigress, enchantress, that, that lineage that she was born into. You know, it's not that different. It's a sad story, but it's not that, and it's not that different from what we hear about elephants, right, in captivity, when they are put on a very heavy chain, you know, from a pole or a tree, and are only permitted to, you know, circle that um, whatever pole or, or post they are attached to. And um, over time, the chain gets lighter, until at the very end, there's maybe no chain at all, and they still stay sort of circling that same perimeter, again, because of the training that they received early on. So what does this have to do with you? Like, why am I telling you a story about a white Bengal tiger, you know, from 1960? Um, and elephants, even to today, I mean, if you look at the elephant trade, I know actually one of my nieces did a documentary on it and it's heartbreaking. Um, but here's the connection. We all grow up within sets of circumstances and belief systems and stories about ourselves and our abilities and our capabilities that are very distant from the truth of who we are as sovereign spiritual beings, right? It's like we're living in this program of indoctrination um, that continually reminds us of our lack of power of our lack of sovereignty, of our need to fit in, of our need to follow the rules, of our need to live somebody else's version of our lives. You know, all of these people with all of their money and even with all of their good intentions who took five years to finally agree and build this enclosure for this beautiful animal this was their idea for her life. And by the time she got to that place and they were able to prod her out of the cage that she had been kept in for so many years, she didn't know who she was anymore. She just went to the far corner, stayed there away from people, basically, you know, walking a space that was not much bigger than the size of the enclosure that she had been kept in for her entire life up until that point. And so how many of us, all of us really, um, live inside these illusions, these enclosures, these structures, these rules that someone else, our parents, our religion, our culture, um, our media, um, anyone who's ever tried to sell us anything, right? We're all living somebody else's version of who we are. You know, part of what I was doing, and I'm, I'm going to go back to it um, when I finish here, is watching the movie Meeting Joe and 
um, it's the story of Joseph Campbell who uh, brought the idea of the hero's journey from his study of mythology and history and literature um, and brought it all together and realized almost every story, every mythological story, every movie, you know, all the great books have this journey, right? Where our life is, where, where we're sort of just living our lives, going along in a certain way. And, you know, I mean, the Wizard of Oz is sort of the perfect example of this. And then the tornado blows through, or maybe it's COVID blows through, or a divorce blows through, or you lose someone who you love, a death blows through, something blows into your life, a cancer diagnosis, and your whole world is, you know, turned upside down and inside out. And then our journey goes from sort of what's familiar and what's known to us and what we think was secure into a place of not knowing, right? We're really in the thick of the journey of trying to get our bearings again. It's like we're in this whole other reality. You know, I certainly, um, you know, can speak to that in my own experience of leaving a 30 year marriage and then trying to get, you know, my feet back under me and asking so many questions. Um, so there's this, something comes in and kind of blows up your life and then this period of trying to adapt and grow and, and, uh, adjust to the new reality and then the final piece is learning the lessons and then bringing them back to share them you know and again all of the you know the great stories whether it's the Wizard of Oz or um, oh my gosh what's the star is Star Wars <laughs> Luke Skywalker and Indiana Jones and all of those movies all have that same same theme so that was a little bit of a of a digression there but my point is i was watching that movie today and um maybe that's when this idea to tell the story about the bengal tiger and the elephant sort of came to mind because it's time now none of us can deny any longer that we are at an incredibly pivotal point right in the world and certainly in the United States. And I've been getting a message for 20 or so years now um, about the need to bring the divine feminine energy um, back into uh, everyday life to begin to anchor the aspects that she holds of kindness and nurturing and strength absolute strength um, inclusion cooperation uh, intuition all of those pieces that have been missing in the uh, overwhelmingly egoic um, masculine energy that has been sort of driving everything on the planet for the last 2,000 years. We are at a place where we are so out of balance that um, really we're bre being brought to our knees. I feel like this is a collective hero's journey or heroine's journey uh, in the case of calling a, a calling out to women to begin to break through whatever old programmings, break out of the structures, break out of the chains, break out of the illusion, break out of the uh, victim stance into your hero stance. You can't be in both, right? In order to be your heroine, you have to let go of, of any victim mentality. Um, and that's where we are right now. I would hate to see any person, uh, in particular, any woman. And I know it's, for me, in, it's particularly poignant, um, you know, having lost my mom as early as I did and uh, not having witnessed her uh, 
being able to move beyond, you know, wife, mother, all the roles that she played that were expected of her into a later life where I may have seen her blossom or bloom, uh, you know, into something or someone else. And I don't want myself or any other woman to leave the planet, you know, to leave her body without having lived the highest expression of herself that she could live in this lifetime. Um, so I have uh, created a six month course that I am just really going live with today. Some people who were on my uh, five day challenge master series last week or on my webinars this past week have heard about it, but I haven't um, brought it out in public yet. So this is sort of my first public uh, acknowledgement of it. And it's called Heal Your Heart, Birth Your Brilliance and Make an Impact. And I'm really so excited to be bringing this forward at this time. It's been something that I have been thinking about probably off and on for years about putting together a group program and I've done little bits and pieces of it, but it's kind of um, been on the back burner, if you will, or just really wasn't gaining the momentum for me to really feel like I was ready to move forward with it. And in the last three weeks or so, it was just like whoosh, some wind came from behind me and said, now it's time. And so there's sort of been this flurry and whirlwind of activity uh, for a few weeks here as I put content together and, you know, did all the marketing aspects of it. But I'm really, really excited to be bringing it forward. And I know, as I said early on, that even as I'm planning the units and the content that it's already changing in my mind. And so while I have a general structure for over the six months, I am leaving a lot of space for grace. I said one of the things uh, I've been pulling cards from my deck, my Mother Mary deck over the last couple of days because I've been reading the Mother Mary chapter in the Sophia Code. And um, Yesterday, I pulled a card, Our Lady of Radiant Grace. And as long as I've had this deck, I've never pulled this card before. Um, but she also talks about, in her own words, a heroine's journey. She says, this is part of the test of being human. We are born to rise above these humiliations and disparagements, to become stronger than them, wiser than them. In doing so, we help liberate others as well, showing the way, a more authentic and healing way to live. We were born not to fear our bodies and deny our spirits, but to love the earth and to fly with the wings of the Holy Mother's grace. Even with powerful and marvelous wings upon our back and the perfect current of the air through which we soar, into freedom and exhilaration. If we do not trust enough to leap, all of this comes to nothing. To live into our divine destiny, which is so much nobler, more compassionate, kind, emotionally rich, creative and rebellious than modern culture would have us believe, we need to trust. We need to trust that we are enough and that we are worthy of receiving. This is not some misplaced sense of entitlement or belief that the world owes us or that the suffering of others only matters when we have our own needs met. The spiritual grace of the Holy Mother does not revolve around immature tantrums of thwarted egos. The ability to receive that this oracle speaks of requires the genuine heart-centered realization that the divine lives and breathes as us and wants to come into full expression through all that we are, unique talents and quirky visions included. That was yesterday's card. Today, after partaking in a worldwide meditation for a peaceful um, election day and transition of government, I pulled 
Our Lady of Peaceful Change. <laughs> I am not making this up. And I actually just pulled it just before I got on, so I haven't even read what it says, but it doesn't even matter because this speaks so perfectly to um, where I've been today trying to balance myself and stay peaceful and trusting that all is divine order um, in whatever is going to happen in these coming days and praying for peace and holding the energy of peace and reminding myself as an ordained spiritual uh, minister of spiritual peace making that I am an instrument of peace. So to pull the Lady of Peaceful Change card today uh, was just perfect. So I'm gonna, I am going to uh, make a call to action and invite any of you who may be feeling that it's time for change, that it's time for something new and different for you, that you're feeling yourself being pulled forward. You know, uh, I've said this before, the Reverend Michael Beckwith, um, I'm sure he said it many times, but I remember when I heard it for the first time that you're pushed by your pain until you're pulled by your passion. And if that's where you find yourself now, whether it's been a lifetime of pain and struggle or a pain that you're in right now, a pain around do I stay or do I go, whether that's a relationship, whether that's a job, whether that's a place you live, whether um, it's a family situation, right? So many of us are in these in-between places where we're feeling it's no longer this, but it's not yet that. We're sort of in that space in between um, where this feels like it's coming to an end. Maybe it's not fully complete yet, but in your mind, there's a knowing, there's an understanding that that is no longer uh, a path that speaks to me like it's time is coming to an end and I don't know what's over here on the other side. So if you're in that space, if you know anybody who's in that space, if you're curious about that space and would like to explore more about it, um, I really encourage you to check out the program that I'm offering. As I said, it's six months long. In those six months, we're gonna meet together on Zoom 18 times. It's three times a month. That's a lot of times. <laughs> and I'm gonna be providing content twice a month to go into the, you know, it'll be loaded into the Facebook group where we will meet. And then when we get online together, we'll explore that further we'll do more teaching, we'll do questions and answers, you'll get one-on-one -on -one coaching around your particular um, understanding or experience or something that you're ready to shift. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna um, sort of take a broad brush and span the spectrum from doing an assessment of where you are now, taking an inventory of your own, I still call it taking your sacred inventory. We're gonna look at, uh, a vision that perhaps you are holding, but it's it may be really unclear. We're gonna look at how your past, your trauma, your challenges have actually been the fertile ground uh, where you are um, growing into your purpose, right? It has provided everything you need once you do the healing then you just have the lessons and the and the grace as uh, this card said yesterday to take that into the world and then we look at ways to really um, become the author you know the word authority comes from the word author 
So where you become the author of your new story and you can take all of those old stories and we, you know, we do this sort of emotional archaeology where we look at them all and brush them off and reframe them and put them back together in a way that everything that seemed broken um, or discarded or unimportant, tossed aside now comes back together with new meaning. Um, so that's my version of Joseph Campbell's uh, journey. We can call it the heroine's journey since uh, my group that's coming up starting November 17th will just be for women. Um, a beautiful sacred container uh, a space where you can find not only support, but accountability, lots of ideas uh, for moving forward, um, however that looks for you in your life. You know, this isn't only for uh, women who feel like they have a big mission in the world. You know, you don't have to be Mother Teresa or, you know, Oprah Winfrey. Um, we all have our own unique soul purpose. You know, our soul chose to incarnate at this time um, for a particular reason. It may be to make a big difference and start a movement, or it may be to fall back in love with yourself so that you can model that to another woman who is, has fallen out of love with herself. It may be to carry the energy of absolute joy or creativity or abundance and gratitude into the world. So you can be on purpose. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to change your whole life around to do something differently. <sighs> I think uh, I think that covers everything and more that I wanted to say uh, here this afternoon. I'm saying this afternoon, but it feels like evening already. So today, you know, the clocks changed last night there this morning. So it's already dark here at five o'clock. Um, so it feels like about eight o'clock. <laughs> So I am going to um, put the link uh, for the page where you can go and get more information about the um, program, the group that will be starting in two and a half weeks or so. Um, so please go take a look. If you have any questions, please feel free to be in touch with me. Um, if you, as I said, know anyone, or even if anyone just pops into your mind, even if it seems like a random name, if spirit is bringing you the name of someone, um, go ahead and forward that information or send, uh, her to this video or give her my name. Um, I would really love to create a container, um, of women that's big enough to have some diversity and for people to bring different experiences in and small enough to be intimate and where everyone feels like they have whatever time she needs, you need to be seen and heard and recognized and supported. So with that being said, let's, um, just bring this sacred time to a close. I didn't open with these today, but I'm gonna close with these. So thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon with me, or if you're listening at another time, thank you for spending your time with me. 
Have a beautiful, blessed, and peaceful week um, as we move through this election time. Um, I know I will be uh, in prayer, continuing in prayer to hold the energy for um, a peaceful election time in the United States as well as um, for whatever result is in our greatest and highest good. And so many blessings to you. I know I will be speaking with um, some of you soon and I look forward to that. Hi Deb. And uh, have a beautiful rest of your Sunday. All right, bye now.